wondering. It was 1912. Ten-year-old Mary Miles Minter was hanging on to her mother's hand for dear life as they hurried down Broadway in New York City. Mama, it's too fast, she cried. Her mother tugged her along even faster. No time for dawdling. We don't want to be late for this audition. Inside the Garrick Theater, it was cold. Mary's teeth were chattering. Her mother turned around and squatted down to her level. You must stop shivering, she ordered, giving the girl a strong shake. You're going to look nervous. But Mary knew it was going to be okay. She'd been performing since she was five years old. Mrs. Shelby pulled a pair of high-heeled tap shoes from her bag and told her daughter to put them on. Now strut and put a smile on your face, her mother instructed. Mary felt unsteady as she walked, but her mother had told her it was time to grow up. Mary was never given any choices where her mother was concerned. Mrs. Shelby was always giving her new things to remember, like her new name and age. A month ago in Chicago, they got in trouble for performing at night when children were supposed to be in bed. Her mother didn't like that rule, so she wrote home to Louisiana and asked for her dead cousin's birth certificate— her cousin was named Mary and would be 16 now, and it was okay for 16-year-olds to perform at night. Overnight, 10-year-old Juliet Shelby was reborn as teenager Mary Miles Minter. Her mother had even taken her favorite doll and burned it in the oven. She said she was teaching Mary a lesson. A 16-year-old didn't need dolls. Mary liked her old name better, but it didn't matter what she liked. It was like her old self was dead. Mother and daughter made their way to the side of the stage where a piano was playing a jaunty tune, a row of women dressed in feathered blue and green costumes were kicking up their heels. Mary thought they looked like the peacocks she had seen in picture books. After the ladies finished, an older man with a notebook said it was Mary's turn. Her mother ran to the piano player and handed him a sheet of music, then waved Mary over and grabbed her by the shoulders. Don't forget the middle part. Step, step, kick, step. And remember, don't act like a child. You're 16 now. Then Mary felt herself being pushed toward the stage. Presenting Mary Miles Minter, her mother yelled. Mary took a deep breath. She was going to show everyone how perfect she was. When the music started, Mary danced. She danced as hard as she could. We get support from Believe Her, a new true crime podcast from Lemonada and Spiegel and Grau. In September 2017, young mom Nikki Adamando shot and killed her partner, Chris Grover. She was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison for murder. Through rare access to police audio, a month-long trial, conversations with Nikki, and original reporting, journalist Justine Vanderloon lays out the killing, the evidence, and the aftermath. As this six-part series unfolds, listeners will put together different pieces of a disturbing puzzle. One thing is clear. Perception is not reality. Believe Her is a riveting chronicle that grapples with assumptions we make about domestic and sexual violence, the long reach of trauma, and the ways in which survival is criminalized, leaving us shocked at how far people will go to avoid seeing what's right in front of them. Believe Her premieres October 21st. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body, season three, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. From Wondery, I'm Tracy Patton, along with my co-host, James Remar. This is Hollywood and Crime, Murder in Hollywood Land. On our last episode, an anonymous letter sent to the district attorney led detectives to investigate the home of star Mabel Normand in their search for the murder weapon. When it proved to be a dead end, new suspects quickly arose. Meanwhile, Hollywood power brokers played fast and loose with the truth, putting careers and the case at stake. Now, Detective Ed King's suspicions are turning to a young actress who was madly in love with the famous director. This is episode three, There's Something About Mary. Detective Ed King and his partner, Sergeant Jesse Wynn, arrive unannounced at the colonial-style mansion of Mary Miles Minter, just as the sun is setting. It's February 6th, 1922, just five days since William Desmond Taylor's murder. The detectives made sure to come by when Charlotte Shelby was away overseeing renovations at their second home. They have no desire to contend with the actress's iron-fisted mother. The housekeeper answers the door and King flashes his badge. We're here to talk to Miss Minter. The housekeeper tells him to wait in the doorway. He says a silent prayer that when the door opens again, it will be Minter. He's only got one chance to get the answers they need. There will already be fireworks when his boss, Thomas Woolwine, the county DA, hears about this unauthorized visit. Woolwine has already frozen King out of the interview scheduled for the next day, but King has a case to solve. If it means going around Woolwine to conduct his own interview, he won't lose any sleep over it. The housekeeper returns and escorts the two detectives into a cavernous living room. Fifteen minutes pass before 19-year-old Minter descends the Spanish-tiled staircase, one hand hovering above the curved wrought iron railing as if it were too hot to touch. She swoops into the room wearing a black dress with a white collar. A servant trails behind, carrying a crystal decanter and glasses on a tray. Mary waves her arm with a flourish. Gentlemen, you must have some of this lemonade. It's simply divine. 
King's not thirsty, but he accepts the glass, hoping it puts the young actress at ease. Wynne refuses his. Does the burly one talk? Mary jokes, clearly anxious. Wynne doesn't say anything. He leans against the wall next to a bookcase, lined with books that don't appear to have ever been read. Mary screws her face into a cute, perplexed look. I'm somewhat confused why you're here. I'm going to be interviewed tomorrow at the district attorney's office. King knew she might bring this up. This is a preliminary. You'd be helping us a lot. I know you were close to Mr. Taylor. I want to help, she says, nervously playing with one of her blonde curls. Mr. Taylor was truly the love of my life. I'm just sick about it all. It's the end King's been waiting for. He asks her what her relationship was like with Taylor. Her face takes on a faraway gaze. You would never understand, she says. He was the first man and the only man who ever embodied all the glories of manhood in one private body. He represented that to me. The two detectives exchange looks. Things are already getting interesting. King asks if she's visited Taylor any time recently. Minter insists she hasn't been there for several months. She's been so busy. King and Wynne are pretty sure it's a lie. Taylor's pal, the actor Arthur Hoyt, told him about her late-night visit to Alvarado Court less than two months ago in December. When pressed, she suddenly remembers it is her way of saying goodbye to Taylor. He had been avoiding her for weeks, even forbid her from talking to him at the writer's ball. She finally had to admit it was over, but she needed closure. She wanted to see him one last time and ended on her terms. King asks if the two ever had a physical relationship. Minter is evasive and then says that their relationship was beyond the physical. Mr. Taylor was too worried about their age difference to make it physical, so it was on a higher plane. King asks the million-dollar question. Just for the record, Miss Minter, where were you the night of Taylor's death? The young actress takes a sip of her lemonade. Her lower lip quivers. You can't think I had anything to do with this murder, she blurts out. The man was so wonderful to me. But the bottom line is, he rejected you, Wynne says coldly. It's not how King would ask it, but it does the trick. Minter states in no uncertain terms that Taylor loved her, and though he was now dead and with God, theirs would be an eternal love that could never be extinguished. And as far as the night of the murder, she had been home all evening reading a book. Her mother and older sister Margaret had been with her. The interview continues for more than an hour. When King starts asking questions about her mother, Charlotte Shelby, Minter's blue eyes dart sideways. How did your mother feel about you and Mr. Taylor? She glares at him. I'm an adult detective. I do as I please. She had no opinion, he queries. Minter sits back on the couch without answering, looking somewhere beyond the detectives, as if she's in a world all by herself. She has done this several times during the interview. King notes the girl has a gift for checking out, but to his detective instincts, her silence speaks volumes. He wonders what secrets she and her mother have and if those secrets are related to the Taylor murder. He'll need to dig deeper, even if Woolwine blocks him at every turn. The Pacific Ocean crashing against the shore below the cliffs felt just like one of her movies, Mary thought. Its cool, gray-blue surface positively twinkled in the midday Santa Barbara sunshine. Mary lifted her face to the warmth. Mr. Kirkwood, or James as he insisted she call him, squeezed her hand as they walked. Every time she looked up at his face, he beamed. It made her knees weak and her heart flutter. It was the summer of 1916. Mary was a huge star now. Her mother had brought her to Hollywood over a year ago when she realized there was more money to be made in the movies than the stage. Now Mary had wrapped another picture where she was the leading lady. And the 15-year-old was madly in love with her 42-year-old director, James Kirkwood. Without even realizing it, the two had fallen for each other. It felt like the very hands of fate were pushing them together. Of course, because of their age difference and the fact that he was married, they had to keep it secret. James insisted, and Mary knew he was right. And then there was her mother, Mrs. Shelby. She had been running Mary's life for years, but Mary wasn't about to let her mother steal her best chance at happiness. James had even told her he loved her. She loved him, too. He pulled her closer as they walked, wrapping his arm around her shoulders. Are you happy, my darling? He asked as they got to an open area where the views of the Pacific seemed to stretch out forever. It's like magic, she said. He stopped by a large boulder and took both of her hands in his. I have longed for this moment, he said. Oh, you have? She gave him a teasing smile, just like the one Mary Pickford used in all those pictures her mother made her watch over and over again. Tell me how pretty I am, the most beautiful creature I ever laid eyes on. But alas, untouched. He looked sad. It hurt her to see him sad like that. She would do anything to make his sadness go away. He lifted her up and placed her atop a big rock. Her heart threatened to rip through her dress. It was pounding so hard. She watched James drop to one knee, holding his hand to his own heart. I pledge my love to you, my dear Mary, as God is my witness. Do you pledge yours to me? I do, she cried. Then under God in heaven, we are married, he declared. We are one. He helped her off the boulder. They embraced passionately, and he kissed her full on the lips. Then he led her to a yellow field of wildflowers. There they made glorious love, and for the first time in her life, Mary was perfectly happy. 
Mary didn't understand that her romantic liaison was in fact statutory rape, the violation of a young girl by a predatory adult male twice her age. For a girl who literally lived in a world of make-believe, it was hard to tell the difference between the hero and the villain. On the night of February 6th, L.A. District Attorney Thomas Woolwine sits in a corner booth at Frank's Cafe, enjoying his very rare steak and an even rarer moment of quiet. The steakhouse on Hollywood Boulevard is the go-to spot for people in the movie business. He recognizes a couple of producers sitting at a table across the room and makes a mental note to say hello on the way out. The D.A. is getting ready to announce his candidacy for governor of the great state of California, and it never hurts to do a little glad-handing. But if he's going to be on the winning ticket, he needs to solve the William Desmond Taylor murder and solve it fast. No one wants to elect a governor who lets a high-profile case like this languish. In the week since Taylor was found dead, leads have poured in, and there have been no shortage of suspects. Mabel Norman is ruled out for the present. Now they're looking at Ed Sands, the ex-valet who stole Taylor's money and disappeared into thin air. But it doesn't feel they're any closer to solving the murder than when his body was discovered five days ago. Woolwine handpicked lead investigator Ed King because of his crime-solving instincts and dogged determination, but he is keenly aware that those very qualities are making it hard to keep King in line. The detective keeps pushing Mary Miles Minter as a suspect. Woolwine scoffs at the thought. She's just a girl, not a killer. But now that the press have sunk their teeth into some story about a damn nightgown and her possible connection to it, he's bringing her in for questioning. But he doesn't consider her a viable suspect. Yes, the girl might be lovesick and immature, but a killer? No. And as far as her mother, Woolwine can vouch for her personally. As if on cue, his attention is drawn to a familiar scent of perfume, a strong floral aroma about as subtle as the woman wearing it. Madam, he says, raising his eyes to find the imposing Charlotte Shelby sliding into the seat across from him. She rubs one gloved hand flat on the white cloth table as if ironing out the wrinkles. To what do I owe the pleasure of your company this evening? Woolwine travels in some of the same circles as the movie people. He first met Shelby at a charitable function. But Woolwine knows her much more intimately than most people would think. A year ago, they had a discreet and brief affair. Most people in town don't like Charlotte. She's a rare woman who pushed her way into a world of men without so much as a buy your leave. But she and Woolwine are Southerners, and he appreciates her Louisiana drawl and sharp features. Although the affair is long over, he's not quite over her. Not that he's going to do anything about it, though. He can't afford any distractions now when he wants to run for governor. She's a potential liability. He quickly casts his eyes around the restaurant to make sure no press people are lurking behind a flower pot. Nobody is here, she says, reading his mind. Nobody of consequence. Woolwine tells her it's better to reach him by phone. I prefer to deliver important messages in person, she responds. I consider you dragging my daughter to your office tomorrow a betrayal. Woolwine understands she's being protective. He gently explains that the interview he personally set up has been designed to protect Mary. She can bring her lawyers. She will be interviewed by his own deputy, who is loyal to Woolwine. Perfectly painless, he tells her. Shelby nods curtly. Okay. Woolwine doesn't dare tell her he has the power to override her. She tells him Mary phoned her earlier to tell the Detective King made an unannounced visit to her home and interrogated Mary. This was unacceptable. Woolwine isn't happy to hear King went behind his back. He should have known King would try something. The damn detective was stubborn. But the truth is, the DA had not been frank with King either. Woolwine did not tell him about his relationship with Shelby, and he didn't tell King he had given Charlotte the name of a private investigator a few months earlier to help her obtain a gun. She said it was for protection for her and Mary, and Woolwine thought he was coming to the aid of a woman in distress. Now, of course, the whole thing could be examined in a different light, and not a flattering one. But King will never understand. The DA needs to keep a tight lid on the potentially damaging information. I can understand why you're so upset, Mrs. Shelby. But we both know Mary has nothing to hide, and I assure you Detective King will be dealt with. Shelby tells him she is weary of the whole Taylor mess. The man had been nothing but trouble for Mary. Ever since she met him, Mary has been extremely difficult to handle. She stands up, pulling the collar of her coat tighter. I will, as always, follow your counsel, but it's vitally important you understand the fragility of my position, she says. Her voice is low and direct, more than implying a threat. I will not have my name or my daughter's name further sullied by the murder of this ridiculous man. Good night. She turns on her heels and walks away, leaving Woolwine with only the smell of her perfume behind. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and a 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside of an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. Secrets that, once uncovered, would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3 Fox Lake on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. Are you true crime obsessed? 
Once you finish Murder in Hollywood Land, then your next podcast needs to be Wondery's Generation Y. Hosts Aaron and Justin have been busting myths, rounding up conspiracy theories, and retracing murderous steps since 2012. Every week they find a murder, bizarre event, or person of interest, and attempt to put the pieces together. They've covered well-known cases like the Golden State Killer to smaller, more mysterious cases you've likely never heard of. Stay tuned until the end of this episode to hear a preview of Generation Y. Mary Miles Minter had been gaining weight a few months into her affair with director James Kirkwood. Her mother put her on a series of diets, but nothing worked. The 15-year-old kept getting bigger, and not even a corset helped. It wasn't much longer before Mrs. Shelby had put two and two together, and all hell had broken loose. Mary was forbidden to see James. Mrs. Shelby threatened her beloved, said she'd ruin his career and tell the papers if he came near her again. She was so cruel. How far away her happiness with James seemed now. Mary lay on her bed in a pile of silk linens, grasping her stomach and sobbing into her pillow. Her grandmother, the only person she could call Mama, was talking softly to her and whispering words of comfort. But Mary could not bear any of it. Such was the depth of her physical and emotional pain. Mary couldn't even close her eyes because all she could see was the doctor with the metal forceps. All she could feel was the cold steel pressed against her skin. All she could smell was iodine and alcohol. Her mother had stolen her youth, and now she had taken away her child. She held the pillow to her face, her body racked with sobs. For not the first time, she longed for her daddy. He had been gone for more years than she had been alive. Where he was or what he thought of his daughter was a mystery to her. Mary imagined he was a sad, lonely man who never forgot the loss of his family. She knew what sadness was. It felt like it was almost all she'd ever known. Her life was over. She thought of her lover, now all the way across the country in New York, and it made her cry even more. She knew only one thing at that moment. Pure, unadulterated hate toward her mother. Mary swore then that she would never again let Mrs. Shelby stand in the way of her happiness. She would rather die. Detective Ed King parks his Indian scout in front of the precinct and hops off. It's early morning, Tuesday, February 7th, and the buzzing about the murder of William Desmond Taylor is at a fever pitch. Already, King is getting reports about people gathering outside of St. Paul's Pro Cathedral in downtown Los Angeles for the 2 p.m. funeral, hoping to get a look at what was sure to be a star-studded affair. Extra police officers are being assigned security detail for what is soon to be a massive crowd. Inside the precinct, he follows the smell of fresh coffee and stale cigarettes to the bullpen area, where the shifts gather for briefings. Today, all the departments are here. It's the first time they've been able to get into one room to review all the evidence that's been discovered so far. King nods to Wynn, who's leaning against the wall, hands folded per usual. Captain David Adams sits on a battered desk at the front. Adams is in charge of the LAPD detectives making him King's boss. The two men are polar opposites when it comes to their work. Adams is quick to leap to conclusions without enough evidence, and he never misses a chance to grab at the spotlight. King is relentless and methodical, and couldn't care less about the press. Adams usually leaves King alone because he gets results, but there's friction. God's gift to police work just arrived, Adams crows. How's it feel to be the DA's lapdog? The uneasy laughter that follows is because Adams is the boss. Not because he's funny. When the room quiets down, Adams gets to the business at hand. The Taylor murder. The police switchboard has been lighting up faster than the electric chair at Folsom State, he tells them. They've received so many tips it's been impossible to keep up. Everything from witnesses claiming they've seen Taylor himself walking the streets of L.A. to crackpots with fake confessions. But Adams is betting that Taylor's ex-valet, Ed Sands, is their man. Sands had already stolen money and suits from Taylor's bungalow. And then on December 4th, Taylor reported a break-in. While the burglar was unknown, whoever did it made off with expensive jewelry and his imported gold-tipped cigarettes. Two weeks later, his valet, Henry Peavy, found a freshly smoked gold-tipped cigarette butt on the ground outside Taylor's bungalow. A couple weeks later, Taylor received a letter from Sands with pawn tickets for the stolen items. Sands had signed the tickets using Taylor's real name, William Dean Tanner. King still isn't convinced the facts add up to a motive for murder. He pegged Sands as a career criminal who liked toying with the director, especially if there was money to be made. But he wasn't the killer. Captain Adams disagrees. He thinks Sands had plenty of motive, and he crept back into Taylor's place and surprised him. Maybe he wanted money and Taylor refused to hand anything over. Maybe Sands was a nut job, obsessed with the director. The consensus in the room seems to agree with Adams. Sands is still the strongest suspect, but there are other dangling threads. The mysterious letter that was sent to the DA pointing to Mabel Normand as the killer has yet to be traced. Either someone was trying to frame Normand, or it was a crank with no connection to the case. There were numerous checks from Taylor's checkbook ledger made out to cash, which no one could account for. The amounts ranged from $200 to $1,500. Maybe he was hiding more secrets, which made him susceptible to blackmail. After all, the director had left a shady past behind to start a new life. He even changed his name. There was also a possible drug angle. The vice squad was running down a lead that Taylor had gone to the feds about some dealers he wanted kicked off the studio a lot. Drug use and trafficking had always been a huge problem for the studio. Maybe those dealers were connected to his druggy Hollywood friends, like Mabel Normand. But until they could get more information, it was all speculation. A description for the possible killer came from two gas station attendants. 
They said a tall man in a cap came in and asked for directions to Taylor's house just before 6 p.m. the night of his murder. A woman out walking her dog around the same time gave a similar description of a man heading around the back of Taylor's unit. Two downtown trolley operators said a similar-looking man got on at a stop just around the corner from Taylor's house a few minutes after he was shot. And then there was Taylor's neighbor, Faith McLean, who had run to the door after hearing the gunshot just before 8 p.m. She described seeing a strange man stepping out of Taylor's doorway, looking straight at her. He was cool, calm, and collected. He even stepped back into Taylor's bungalow for a moment as if he'd forgotten something. Then he smiled at Mrs. McLean when he left. The man was about five foot nine, wore a dark suit and a gray or plaid cap. She was quoted as saying, he was not a well-dressed man. He was dressed like my idea of a motion picture burglar. The question was, could it have been Sands? Sands had a distinctive walk due to being bow-legged, but none of the witnesses mentioned that the man they saw walked with an odd gait. And wouldn't Faith McLean have recognized Sands? She had seen him almost every day during the months when he was Taylor's valet. All in all, there were still more questions than answers. Is that everything we got, Captain Adams asks? King speaks up. There's Mary Miles Minter. Could be a case of unrequited love. Adams immediately puts the kibosh on the notion. She's 5'2", 100 pounds soaking wet, and nobody saw a woman that night. King says, maybe she got someone else to do it. King tells them, maybe Minter's family is protecting her. The mother, Charlotte Shelby, is domineering and seems overly protective of her cash cow. She might have been involved. Adams doesn't buy it, and King doesn't argue. With pushback from the DA, and now Adams, he's going to have to play his cards close to his vest. By the end of the meeting, Sands is still the favorite. And as far as the captain is concerned, there are no other suspects. Mabel's new job with Sam Goldwyn in 1915 started well, but in the end, it was trading one devil for another. Soon after her arrival, Goldwyn began to pursue Norman for an intimate relationship, just as Senate had two years before. She fended off his advances at first, but eventually gave in. In some ways, Mabel saw the relationship as job security. If she said no, she'd be fired, and then where would she be? Goldwyn was only 36, but had the demeanor of an old-school taskmaster. The studio had wanted to remake Mabel by smoothing out her rough edges and toning down her body sense of humor. He insisted she attend etiquette training, which she hated. His critical nature was just one of many things she grew to loathe about him as the affair went on. Mabel had gone into the relationship with her eyes wide open, but quickly realized it was a mistake. He was the one pulling the strings with her as his puppet. But for all the faults Goldwyn found with her, he didn't want to give her up. She felt powerless. And the only thing that made the relationship even mildly tolerable was to drink and snort cocaine. The relationship with Goldwyn ended horribly. She got pregnant and intended to have the baby. She felt like she'd be a good mother. She had a lot of love to give. She told a few close friends but was too ashamed to tell Billy. And she continued to work. Then, in her second trimester, she miscarried. A baby boy. The trauma left Mabel badly shaken. Then she spiraled even further. She used drugs and booze like it was candy. Her friends often found her passed out after parties. She spent whole days in bed recovering. One time a friend found her in a daze at the Ritz Hotel, clearly addled by some sort of drug. It was after the premiere of one of her films, and she was surrounded by boxes of bouquets from her friends and admirers. But the flowers were still in their boxes, left to rot. That's what Mabel felt like. A rotting mess. Charlotte Shelby is having breakfast in bed. Her assistant, Carl, brings her the morning papers and asks her if she needs anything else. No, thank you, Carl. You may go. He bows his head and tiptoes out. Charlotte has spent years crafting her image as a person not to be trifled with. For most of the people in Hollywood, mainly men, it translates into being labeled a bitch. At least Carl shows her proper respect. Charlotte is still vaguely unsettled from her meeting last night with District Attorney Woolwine. She hates not being in control. She needs to regroup, focus on the task at hand, Mary's new contract negotiations. Charlotte is preparing for another battle royale with Adolf Zucker, Mary's boss at Famous Players Lasky. The strange little man is among the most powerful forces in the business, but Charlotte has learned how to be a formidable opponent. Four years ago, she cleverly played Zucker against producer Louis J. Selznick and let the two moguls duke it out over who would get Mary. Zucker won. It cost him a million dollars. Now Charlotte's pushing him for a raise. She knows he'll push back. When he first signed her, she was hailed as the next Mary Pickford, but lately the papers have been saying she lacks Pickford's star quality. It's ridiculous. Mary didn't have to be the next Mary Pickford to be a big success. Charlotte will remind the little man that her daughter's last movie earned twice what it cost to make. She examines Mary's new contract and crosses out some confusing legal gibberish. Her changes will be finished this morning, ready to be sent back with her counteroffer. Mary's worth more than a million. Where is Mary anyway? Probably getting ready for Taylor's funeral. Hopefully after the service they can move past this whole tiresome business. It's as if the man was the King of England. She never liked him. Found him to be snooty, just like everybody else in this godforsaken town. All those women fawning over him. It was absurd. And men, too. She was there one night at the opera when Taylor showed up with the set designer, George Hopkins. Who brings a man to the opera? It was unseemly. She thought Mary was past crushes on older men after her traumatic affair with the lecherous James Kirkwood. 
Charlotte never wants to think back to that horrible time. A 42-year-old with an innocent 15-year-old girl. Men were vile. But no, Mary has to fall for William Desmond Taylor. Keeping her daughter away from him had been almost a full-time job. That girl was going to be the death of her. That whole incident at the funeral home was humiliating. The press made Mary look like a dumb Dora. Charlotte pushes away the thought as she unfolds the morning's examiner. She eyes the headline and nearly spits her tea all over her imported Italian bedspread. A love letter from Mary to Taylor is emblazoned across the front page. Dearest, I love you, I love you, I love you, followed by a series of X's. Charlotte bellows Carl's name. He practically falls racing into the room. Get Mary on the phone now, she barks. Yes, ma'am, Carl, she yells after him. Tell her that under no circumstances is she to leave her house. William Desmond Taylor's funeral is slated to begin at 2 p.m. For Mabel Normand, it makes the nightmare all too real. If you could hear a person's heart breaking, Mabel knew hers would sound like thunder. She huddles in the back of her Rolls Royce, the view outside shrouded by the black veil she's wearing. On the seat next to her, her housekeeper keeps a firm grip on her gloved hand. Mabel can barely hold it together. She doesn't even notice how her driver has to slowly steer the car through a dense crowd just to get to the curb in front of the cathedral. Mabel forces herself to get out when her driver opens the door. The weather has warmed considerably, but rain is in the forecast, turning the sky a dreary gray. Well, she thinks, at least God knows how to match her dismal mood. As soon as she steps onto the sidewalk, a great roar rises up behind her. She keeps her gaze downward. If only she could disappear. So many people, it's hard to believe, her housekeeper whispers. They're blocking traffic and the police are on horseback. Mabel feels hundreds of eyes burning into her passing judgment. The press hounds haven't let up with their evil stories. She was a dope fiend, a murder suspect, and then all those letters she'd written to Billy. They were innocent enough, but the newspapers were clawing at anything to make their friendship look like some love affair gone wrong. On the way into the service, Estelle Lawton Lindsay of The Examiner asks for a comment. Lindsay is a reporter who had always treated her fairly. Mabel begs, get it straight, please. We were friends. There was no love affair. We weren't planning on getting married. He wasn't killed over me. But even as Mabel says the words, she's not so sure. Billy had been there for her in the worst moments of her drug days, and when she got straight, he was the one who had chased her old dealers away. Did one of them seek payback? The thought chilled her to the core. As she's escorted to the second pew, inside the Gothic cathedral, all she can think about is Billy lying in that coffin. It's bittersweet to see all his friends seated throughout the church. If he were here, they'd have a good laugh about it together. It looks more like a gathering of Hollywood royalty than a funeral. Gloria Swanson, Wallace Reed, Thomas Ince, the McLeans, Rudy Valentino, and of course, Edna Provines. Many of Billy's fellow directors have come to pay their respects too. All of Hollywood is shuttered for the day. All for him. The American beauty roses she ordered are scattered beneath his coffin covered by a Union Jack flag. Billy's British army cap rests on the top. He was getting the full military treatment. He had once told her about his father's disappointment when he got turned down by the army as a young man. When he finally got to serve in World War I, he was so proud to wear his uniform. As the kilted bagpipers play a mournful tune and file past the open coffin, Mabel's grief is too much to bear. She faints, falling to the floor. When she comes to, she pulls herself up, but the loss of her friend and confidant is a wound from which she'll never recover. Later, when the director is interred at Hollywood Memorial Cemetery, it's under his real name. The plaque reads, In memory of William C. Dean Tanner. By 1919, Mabel Normand was flitting from party to party, not really caring where she was, as long as the booze wasn't watered down and drugs were nearby. One night, she found herself at a dinner party at some mansion in Beverly Hills. She was sipping on a gin ricky when she was cornered by an actor who happened to have an idea for a comedy. She couldn't remember his name, only that he had no sense of humor. Things picked up considerably at dinner when Mabel was seated next to the elegant, distinguished director, William Desmond Taylor. She recalled they once lived in the same building. They may even have waved hello once or twice. Hard to say. Their conversation worked its way around to books, and Taylor listened to her with an enthusiasm she'd never experienced in this town. Most people were so caught up in themselves, it was all you could do to get them to look you in the eye. But Taylor seemed to genuinely appreciate her wit. He laughed at her silly jokes. They shared a love of literature and had both read a little-known book about an obsessive whaling captain. I thought it was nifty, she said. But can I tell you a secret? I was rooting for the whale. Taylor laughed. Most people in this town don't read anything but scripts, he said with a wink. You forget the newspapers, sir, filled with exciting material like the sordid tales of Mabel Normand, crazy as a loon and on the hop. He looked at her before answering. I don't follow yellow journalism. Mabel could have hugged him right there. They continued to talk for hours, the party receding into the background. People came, people left, but neither of them noticed. When it was time to say their goodbyes, Mabel knew they would become close friends. She couldn't remember the last time a man had tried to seduce her brain and not her body. When he asked for her phone number in his most gentlemanly fashion, it never occurred to her to say no. As they parted ways, he turned and said, 
Just so you know, I rooted for the whale too. Outside St. Paul's Cathedral, Detective Ed King closely watches the crowd. He's been here since the movie people started arriving, and he's never seen so many Hollywood stars in one place at one time. He's impressed at their devotion to the dead man. Whatever Taylor's peccadilloes, his friends and co-workers seem to have adored him. In statements, they paint a picture of a generous and caring man. No wonder so many people have come to pay their respects. After the ceremony, King stands back, waiting for the mourners to exit the cathedral. When the coffin is carried out, the pallbearers have to wade through the massive crowd to get to the car that will take Taylor on his final journey to the Hollywood Memorial Cemetery. A hundred automobiles will follow the procession, along with a full company of bagpipers. There is no mistaking the importance of the man who is being laid to rest today. But of all stars attending the somber ceremony, King takes note of one glaring omission. The lovesick Mary Miles Minter is nowhere to be seen. He's rather surprised, and he doesn't surprise easily. Sure, her love letters to Taylor are plastered all over the examiner. It's no doubt embarrassing to Minter, but her feelings for Taylor seem genuine. Maybe it's the funeral, or seeing tears flow for the dead man. But King feels a little bad for the Minter girl. In his 18 years on the force, he's seen how poisonous Hollywood can be. For every kid who makes it, there are a hundred others who end up broke, in jail, or worse. But what happens to those who reach the pinnacle, that stuff that dreams are made of, can be just as unlucky. Like Minter, who has known nothing other than a world of make-believe. He wonders what will happen if that world comes crashing to an end. Mary had spent the entire train ride from L.A. brooding, pouting, and plotting her escape. It was 1919, and she had just arrived in Boston to shoot her new film, Anne of Green Gables. The production people were fawning all over her, but Mary just wanted to be left alone. She was stuck here waiting to meet her new director. She watched her mother across the room ordering the crew around and taking in all of the attention as if she was the star. Mary could barely look at her half the time. The anger boiled up like a steaming tea kettle. Mary was a huge star, but the 17-year-old felt like a bird in a gilded cage. She was counting the days when she would no longer be under her mother's control. If only she had someone in her life, a special man, a knight in shining armor to whisk her away. Of course, her mother was constantly wagging her tongue about men wanting to take advantage of Mary. Her mother still hated James Kirkwood, who had supposedly almost ruined her life. What does she know? If her mother hadn't chased him away, they'd be married by now. He told her so, didn't he? Mary continued to stew, wondering what time the shoot wrapped, and she could tell her driver to take her back to her hotel. And then he strode into the room. A tall, distinguished, and handsome man with the warmest smile she had ever seen. It was as if he had a beacon of light around him. This is God, she thought, her heart beating faster and faster, and he was walking her way. How do you do, Miss Minter, he said, offering his hand to her. It felt strong and as warm as his smile. She was enthralled. I'm William Taylor, he said. I'll be directing this picture. He gave her other instructions about her role in the movie, but she was too mesmerized to pay much attention. He didn't call her Mary like everyone else did. He called her Miss Minter, which meant he saw her as a woman. It felt like the hands of fate had somehow intervened to rid Mary of her misery. He might be older, but she knew immediately that she could love him forever. She could follow him into the unknown abyss of life, and all would be well. After two minutes or five, Mary couldn't be sure, she realized she was still holding his hand. There was an awkward silence, and then she laughed. Delighted to make your acquaintance. I look forward to working with you. Then, as if summoned by a genie, Mrs. Shelby appeared by her side. Mr. Taylor, I'm Charlotte Shelby, Mary's mother. Her voice was brisk, authoritative. Could I go over some things with you? Of course, ma'am. I'd be happy to, he said, turning away from Mary. They walked off, leaving Mary standing there. But hope had returned to her heart. Who knew a day that started so rotten could drop her true soulmate right into her lap? The downtown streets of L.A. are finally emptying out when Detective King heads over to D.A. Thomas Wilwine's office. He's not looking forward to facing his boss to explain why he disobeyed orders and interviewed Mary Miles Minter. When King walks into the office, the D.A. is on the phone. His deputy D.A., Robert Durant, sits in the corner reading some notes. Wilwine quietly looks over to him and takes the notes out of his hands and starts editing them with a red pencil. Then he hangs up the phone and turns to King. I think we got off on the wrong foot, Detective, Woolwine says. Or perhaps it's not clear who's running the show here. I specifically and repeatedly told you to stay away from Miss Minter, and because you didn't, her name is now sullied in the papers. King holds his gaze. You told me to follow this investigation wherever it leads, and that's what I did. So that explains why you're the only cop in Los Angeles on this angle. Your arrogance astounds me. King asks, am I being taken off the case? The DA tells him no. He has no intention of firing King. It wouldn't look good for the department. Woolwine wants him to refocus. Find the real killer. Stop going down a rabbit hole, detective, he says. King is silent. He knows enough to sit and take his punishment, whatever it is. The DA hands him the pages he's been redlining and tells him it's a statement. King will read it at the press conference scheduled for ten minutes from now. King looks it over, noting the name at the top. Edward Sands. 
Let me sum it up for you, Detective King. We're putting out an all points on Sands tonight. He is our primary suspect. Adams has me convinced. And after Duran here interviewed Miss Minter last night, we're satisfied there's absolutely nothing further to pursue with her. King doesn't agree. With all due respect, I think there's still plenty to look into with Minter. In fact, I think we need to get a sit-down with her mother. Woolwine looks like he swallowed an angry bird. You'll read the statement, pursue Sands, follow my lead. That'll be all, Eddie. Now get out. King turns on his heels and leaves the DA's office, fuming. He will read the press release. He will do his job. But Woolwan is a fool if he thinks King is walking away from the two prime suspects in the William Desmond Taylor homicide. On the next episode of Hollywood and Crime, Murder in Hollywoodland, while the search for Taylor's ex-valet continues, Ed King discovers explosive evidence that puts a key suspect at the scene of the crime. This was episode three of six of Murder in Hollywoodland from Hollywood and Crime. If you like what you've heard, be sure to tell your friends and fans of True Crime. We're counting on you to help us spread the word. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Murder in Hollywoodland was written by Elizabeth Cosen and produced and edited by Laura Donna Palavoda. Additional editing assistance by Leah Sutherland. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Additional audio editing by Marcelino Villalpando. Our consultant is William J. Mann. His book, Tinseltown, Murder, Morphine, and Madness at the Dawn of Hollywood, has a lot more amazing stories about Hollywood and the way the studios operated in the silent era. Executive producers are Marshall Louis, Stephanie Jens, and Hernan Lopez, for Wondery. You're about to hear a preview of the Generation Y podcast from Wondery. While you're listening, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. Tonight's case, we are revisiting something that we've already covered in the past. It was episode 203. This is the Holly Bobo case. Back when we covered this case, Justin, it had not gone to trial. We knew that they had people arrested, that there were people talking, but we didn't have, you know, the real answers. All this time later, we still don't have the answers, I don't think. At the time we covered it, there weren't any convictions. And since we covered it, they have gone to trial, been found guilty, and put away. But let's give a quick uh, rundown on what happened the day Holly disappeared. And for those of you that are familiar, bear with us as we give a quick synopsis. Holly Bobo was a nursing student at the University of Tennessee. She was 20 years old. You know, if you look at her pictures, she's a very attractive young lady. Everyone found her to be very friendly, well liked. It was on the morning of April 13th, 2011 that her brother Clint woke up and looked out through a window to see Holly, who should have been off to university already. She was kneeling down near the car, talking to someone who was dressed in camouflage. Well, Clint had just woken up and his first thought was, that's probably her boyfriend Drew because he was supposed to be turkey hunting that day. This guy's wearing camouflage like he's a hunter. So it sort of makes sense, right? Yeah. So he doesn't think too much of it, but he ends up seeing Holly walk into the woods right alongside this guy, which is very unexpected, boyfriend or not. Why would they walk off into the woods? Especially when he knows that she's supposed to be in school. Before Holly and the man are seen walking off to the woods, he gets a call from his mother, Karen. Karen had gotten a call from a neighbor who said, I heard a scream coming from the vicinity of your home, and they were concerned. So Karen called home, and Clint said, she's just with Drew. But according to his mom, she knew that there was no way Drew was going to be there because he was going to be turkey hunting. So there's no way he would have been at the home. Of course, what does the mom say to him when he acts like, well, it's just her boyfriend, right? Well, she freaks out and says, that's not her boyfriend. And even goes on to say, shoot him. It's kind of a strong reaction. There are two ways we can look at this. Um, one way could be that she has her motherly instinct that says, based on all the information that I know, there's no way that someone is a friendly person. Uh, we need to take action to save Holly. The other idea here could be that her mom knows something more. So whether it's an instinct or based on information, that's what Karen says, get a gun and shoot this guy. Now, the description that Clint gives is, he says he never saw this man's face. So he only saw the general um, shape of the man, knew he was wearing camouflage, saw that he was holding something black in his hand that he thought was you know, possibly um, a device that's used in hunting. They call it a deer grunt. But other than that, he says he couldn't really make out what the man was saying, but he did hear his sister say, no, why? I think he even said he had dark hair, brown shoulder length hair. Still, because Holly should have already been at school because she had a big exam that day, he thought this must be something important between her and her boyfriend. I'm not calling the police on her boyfriend. You know, if they're breaking up, 
I'm not getting in the way of that. But as we know, whoever that was, it was not Drew. We also know that Holly, uh, at least her remains, were later found, and she had been the victim of murder. So when we fast forward, the state had brought a case against a man by the name of Zach Adams. And Zach is a known meth dealer, correct? Yeah. And where this is located, it's very, uh, I won't even call it rural. It's its up in a, a wooded area. There's hills and just thick woods. So people would refer to some of these meth heads as like outback hillbillies. But Holly's from a good family. She's going to school to become a nurse. So its it's just a mix in this area. You have some people that they go to drugs and other people that are hardworking and trying to get on with their lives. But the police would end up talking with a man named John Dylan Adams, who happens to have an intellectual disability. And John Dylan Adams will tell law enforcement that he saw his brother, Zach, with his friend, Jason Autry, with Holly. And that's what gets law enforcement after Zach and Jason. The purpose of us revisiting this is not to necessarily go through the case as the state told it. Really, what this is all about is to point out the issues that the case has, continues to have, and... I think it's very important because Zach has some court action left and we're waiting to find out where this will go. And so, yes, they've gotten a conviction on Zach Adams, but I think there's a real question here about whether that will hold up or not. I will say that when this case was first finished, at least as far as the trial went, I could see how it got there based on the uh, terrible crime that was committed here against Holly Bobo and the fact that the state had said this was a case involving murder and drugs and abduction and that there were all these guys involved, Zach Adams, Jason Autry, Shane Austin, John Adams, and maybe others. They had a lot of people to call to get on the stand and tell their stories. Zach Adams maintained all along they had nothing to do with this. You got the wrong guy. I mean, at one point, he even put his right hand up and said, right hand before God, I had nothing to do with this. But of course, this is an emotionally charged case. It was the most expensive investigation, most far-reaching investigation in the state of Tennessee's history, as far as I'm aware. People wanted this solved. And so when you have the state saying, Zach is the ringleader, he's the one that did this to Holly and is responsible for her abduction, for the rape and murder of her, then why wouldn't people go forward with that? But again, we're going to start bringing up the evidence and we'll kind of compare and contrast here and we'll see, does it really hold up? 